how it kind of takes place, of course, after the ending of Dawn of Ragnarok. There should be some story moments in there, here and there. And Jose said that it's not coming with the next update, but the one after that. So I think like August, although the five to six week schedule is a bit different for year two. So it could be earlier or later than that. And we should also stay tuned to the end of the year for the last episodes of Eivor's story. Also no concrete info on this yet, although we of course know that Eivor gets buried in Vinland. So we find the grave in the modern day and can of course already go to the exact location in Vinland. Just my speculation, but I would not be surprised if this is how Eivor dies. And Darby, the narrative director on Valhalla at the end of last year, also hinted that he was involved with some of the year two content for the game would make sense if he was working on this although again that's not confirmed right now we only know that we get a free last episode of Aver story at the end of the year which also basically confirms that we can expect like updates and content till at least November 2022. But again, there's also more coming and I wanna dive more into that. Otherwise this video will be very long. So look forward to that. Just subscribe for everything on the future of Assassin's Creed and Valhalla. A like on the video would really help me out. And you can check out my watch along of the celebration stream by clicking on the screen. You wanna skip ahead though for like 30 minutes and that is when it starts. For now, I will speak to you soon. Goodbye. A handful of new details about Starfield have come out that's got fans and critics a little steamed up. Oh, and despite Starfield not being out yet, and Elder Scrolls 6 still being in pre-production, Fallout 5 has been confirmed. All right, let's get into it. Of course, on Sunday, we got the first official gameplay trailer and walkthrough for Bethesda's long-awaited open-world action RPG. Bethesda director and executive producer Todd Howard showed off the starting area for the game, combat, character customization, multiple factions, crafting, base building, and even shipbuilding. However, there was one part of the presentation that left potential players with more questions than answers. Howard explained that in Starfield, you can land anywhere on a planet and that there are multiple planets in a system and 100 systems in the game, adding up to approximately 1,000 planets to potentially explore in Starfield. This kicked off online discourse across social media, message boards, and gaming websites simply because we've heard and seen this kind of thing before. No Man's Sky has certainly come a long way, but in the beginning there were a lot of procedurally generated planets with not much variety and not much to do on them. While that might make for an accurate representation of space, it doesn't exactly make for fun times while playing a video game. Now, Starfield is looking like it might run into a similar situation. In a recent interview with IGN, Todd Howard addressed the rising concerns, implying that fans shouldn't be too worried since Bethesda has been using procedural generation in their games for a very long time including with Skyrim and going all the way back to Elder Scrolls 2. Howard went on to say, I should also add that we have done more handcrafting in Starfield content-wise than any game we've done. We're at over 200,000 lines of dialogue, so we still do a lot of handcrafting, and if people just want to do what they're used to in our games and follow a main quest and do the quest lines, you're gonna see what you'd kind of expect from us. He continued, but then you have this whole other part of, well, I'm just going to wander this planet and it's going to provide some gameplay and some random content and those kinds of things. He went on to explain, so we're pretty careful about saying, here's where the fun is. Here's this kind of content. But if you want to go land on that weird planet, check it out and build an outpost, and live your life there and watch the sunset because you like the view of the moons there, go for it. We love that stuff. Now, that all seems like a fairly reasonable response, but it doesn't exactly or directly address the concerns players have brought up about having a thousand worlds to explore, but nothing really to do on them. According to Howard, Bethesda will be talking more in depth about their approach to procedurally generated content and how it fits into the game in the coming months. One additional issue that came up though with some players surrounding planets is that Starfield will not support a direct flight from space to planet or planet to space in game. Basically, there will be a loading screen in between or some type of transition instead. Howard addressed that as well, saying early on the Starfield team decided a planet's surface is one reality and space is another arguing that it would allow them to better focus on making each component of the game better. He explained, if you try to really spend a lot of time engineering the in-between, like the segue, you're just spending a lot of time on something that's really just not that important to the player. So let's make sure it's awesome when you're on the surface and awesome when you're in space, and those realities look and play as good as they can. Now, people seem to be pretty split on this, so much so that it 
could have potentially even contributed to No Man's Sky trending on Twitter. That is, of course, alongside all of the other comparisons players are making between No Man's Sky and Starfield. Of course, No Man's Sky does support that kind of seamless transition uh, of flying from a planet's surface out into space or vice versa, coming out from space and being able to land anywhere on a planet's surface. Some players are obviously going to miss the feeling of seamlessly exploring endless space, but you know, others feel that planet landings are actually kind of a nuisance or a waste of time. There was another criticism that came up when the official Bethesda Twitter account seemingly tweeted out the answer to a common question, writing, yes, dialogue in Starfield is first person and your character does not have a voice. This of course created another schism between fans who are split between whether a voice character is more or less immersive. Some players said it seemed outdated not to have a voice character and made it harder to connect while others refuted that not having a voice doesn't affect their connection with the character they are role playing. One Twitter user said they wanted their character to have a badass voice like Geralt, uh, while another replied, Geralt is already an established character and not a complete blank slate. And basically that in Bethesda games, you're the character, so you're supposed to use your own voice because it's a role playing game. Another fan said they were disappointed and that it feels like a step back from Fallout 4, which had a voice protagonist, while again, others refused saying for them, a voice character can be less immersive. I personally, I'm not entirely sure exactly where I fall in on this argument, but I do know one thing for sure, nobody really truly ever wins a Twitter argument. Oh, and there is, of course, one more bit of news pertaining to the future of Bethesda Game Studios. During that interview with IGN, Todd Howard did happen to confirm Fallout 5. It's not particularly a surprise, but after so many years and versions of Skyrim, I'm sure a lot of people are feeling a little bit salty. Specifically, Howard said, yes, Elder Scrolls 6 is in pre-production and you know, we're going to be doing Fallout 5 after that. So our slate's pretty full going forward for a while. We have some other projects that we look at from time to time as well. IGN did manage to confirm from Todd Howard that Starfield, when it comes out, would have taken over seven years in development. So if you do the napkin math, that's what? Elder Scrolls 6 by about 2030, and then uh, Fallout 5 by 2037 or 2040? Uh, maybe that's being generous. I don't know, maybe that's being too harsh. Let me know in the comments. All right, that's gonna do it for today. Thank you everybody for watching and for more video game news and updates, be sure to stay tuned right here to Inside Gaming. Welcome to the press meeting here. Thank you for coming so relatively short warsel. Vi har i dag en stor glæde at præsentere vores nye cheftræner for 3F Superligaen, nemlig Uwe Røsler. Og derfor så slår jeg nu over i engelsk, da pressemødet vil foregå på engelsk. Welcome. We'll do this in English. First of all, very warm welcome to Uwe Røsler, our new head coach. We will in a moment open up for questions. And after this press conference, Uwe and Stig Inge Bjørneby will be available for further interviews one-on-one -on -one for you guys from television and radio. But first, I would like to give the floor to our chairman, Lars Fonny. Yes, thank you, Søren. Um, and also from my side, a warm welcome to you, Uwe. Um, we, are, we are so happy and, and also so proud that we are able now to present um, you and uh, as our new coach here in, uh, in AGF. We have had a relatively long process. We have lot of, made a lot of efforts to uh, to find the right candidate to, to this important position in the AGF. And uh, there has been quite a lot of meetings between especially Steve and you and Jakob. And um, Ufa and I from the board has also been involved in, in, in the very last round. So we can say that we are, we are a united team here that thinks that we have made uh, the right uh, decision and uh, I just want once again to, to welcome you very warmly here to uh, to and to ours. Thank you. To, to follow up, uh, Lars, um, it's a, a great pleasure for me to present uh, Uwe as our new head coach. Uh, we invited Uwe uh, very early into the process. Um, it was clear that he was going to be named on the on the growth list. That we uh, that we built, and uh, it's built on a very clear profile 
that we first we developed first of all together with uh, the board and, and uh, Jakob. Uh, the profile is based on what we feel is the uh, the right challenges to attack for the future. Um, uh, Uva has um, uh, impressed massively during the meetings that we've uh, that we've had. His philosophy as a leader um, and his philosophy as a football coach fits perfect uh, with our club values uh, and also with our sporting strategy. Uh, Uwe truly represents hard work uh, based on very clear ideas. Um, he always works with high demands, which belongs to modern professional football and also always with a clear purpose in everything that he do, all his activities under his commands. Um, his level of experience as a top level football coach uh, at top level football uh, clubs is impressive. Uh, and he's always made progress where he's been. Um, I've had uh, I known uh, about Uwe from quite a few years back, and I've followed his uh, coaching career since then. We've even played against each other uh, back in the time. Uh, but I've had the great privilege, also uh, the last few weeks, to uh, uh, collect a significant amount of information uh, and references from the re from relevant people. I didn't ask your mom, Uwe but from uh, relevant people that he's working with, uh, colleagues of mine at former clubs, former players, staff members and everything. And it's been a fantastic uh, privilege to collect those uh, very strong and uh, beneficial uh, references uh, um, that helped us uh, in, the, in the concluding with this decision. We are really looking forward to, uh, to start working to, tonight and tomorrow, and uh, not at least to uh, to uh, be able to present you well in time uh, till the till the preseason kicks off on uh, Thursday with all the players. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And then the floor is yours. Um, remember to press down. Yes. Um, thank you very much for welcoming me so warmly. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, club had took contact to me for a while. Uh, I kept myself busy. Uh, Working for Via, Via Play, a uh, really enjoyable job, analyzing football matches, being in touch with football in that year, what I had off. And, uh, but I always was looking for the right opportunity. And uh, throughout those process of interviews and talks we had, I got uh, more and more excited. Uh, and um, I thank the leaders of the football club to put their faith and trust in me. And I hope I will repay that. And uh, for me, it's, it's very, very important that we all see each other as a, as a unit uh, that starts with the players, with the staff, with the supporters, also with the media. And we, uh, this club has a tremendous potential uh, and we need to unlock that door to get that potential out on the pitch and that consistently year in, year out. That is a, a hard way, a very difficult way, but I think we will only succeed when we all go together. And that is my, my first aim, that we create a culture in this football club, that we try to be unified in, in as many ways as we can get. It's not always. Criticism belongs to the game. We're all aware of this. I'm long enough in the football business, but I think it's very, very important that we, we bond with the supporters, we bond with the media, we give them what they need. I work for the media now. I know what you guys need and, and uh, what you're satisfied with. But the most important thing is on the pitch, and that is my responsibility to help the players, to guide the players, that we find a way, a formation where the players be comfortable with, that we find a style of play where we be successful but also attractive. And um, that will not happen overnight, but uh, that will start on Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. And now we're going to open up for questions. Please ask them in English. If you want to ask them in Danish, I will try to translate in to English, not in German, unfortunately, Uwe. So, uh, the floor is your guys. Yeah, Emil. Uh, hi, Uwe. Congratulations on uh, your new job. Um, can you tell us uh, what kind of uh, playing style are you going to uh, put into AGF? Um, 
But yeah, I think it's very important uh, for me. I think we need to find a DNA where everybody can recognize how we want to play. And that not, not only now and then, so consistently. That doesn't mean that we consistently will win every game, but consistently, even on a, on a supposed to be bad day, we should be seeing the principles of what we stay for. Um, I like football, I like teams, and I did that in the past, who are active. Active against the ball and active with the ball. So that means we find we have to find, first of all, to get the ball. So I like pressing, um, pressing, um, attacking pressing, uh, pressing in mid-block. I don't like to stay very deep for very long. I feel uncomfortable having the whole team in front of their own box. I'm as a striker, I like, I like to be in the opposition box more. Um, and now, obviously, last season, the team started a little bit the stats, um, had the lowest ball possession. We want to improve uh, in possession, uh, but also keeping what the team has been did very well also for years, this um, transition game, offensive transition game, what is very effective and can be very effective. Yeah, thank for you. Yeah, so Dennis. Uh, you mentioned the potential before. Um, a lot of coaches have been sitting where you're sitting right now, talking about potential at, at this club. Um, why, why, why do you think that you are the right coach to to yeah, fulfill this potential in this club? I think um, a coaching career of 18 years set me in good stead for this uh, is a traditional club, a very traditional club, one of the oldest clubs in the country. Um, I have a habit to very often ending up with traditional clubs and I'm used to that because I'm, traditional clubs have a lot of expectation, the supporters a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure. Uh, the focus is very much one city, one club, very much on, on this club. You'll be under the spotlight uh, every day. And uh, potential, first and foremost, before I got interviewed, I, I watched games and I saw the team and I saw uh, when you're having on that level, you have uh, five 20, uh, under 21 international players, then you have already a, a big, a big pool of young, exciting players already, already in the club. Then you have also players who are 23, 24, 25, still the best years to come. You have a big, a big future ahead. This team has a big future ahead. Of course, I have my ideas. Of course, I also think. On the transfer market, I don't know what is possible. I'm too early in, but uh, we maybe have to make one or two additions. Uh, but I think the team excited me, and I think we can do, uh, we can climb up the table. Uh, that is our aim, and, uh, and we want to do that very quick. Also, the fact of potential is um, the club have moved on a lot financially, also infrastructure-wise, over the last years. And when I got presented the plans, new stadium, new academy, um, new training complex here, then it's pretty easy to see for me there is a, a lot of going on in that city, in that club, and I want to be part of this. Yeah, Mister. Yeah, Emil, you come again. Uh, do you prefer playing with the young talented uh, players or uh, more older and experienced uh, players? I think um, I know what you want because I uh, I know what you want to go out. When I went to Malmö, because that is what you meant, because I had, a, I had the oldest team in all Europe so at the time. <laughs> but when I came to Malmö, um, for example, there was the team was 11th in the league, and when Malmö is 11th in the league, it is like FC Copenhagen is 11th in the league. So uh, I got asked. Uh, my task was Malmö Alti winner. And uh, that is what I did, uh, what we did. And uh, to do that, to climb up the table, finish third, to be in, in Europe in the, in the group stages, um, you needed to have experience.